really, church and all of Christianity is about change, isn't it? It's about making changes, experiencing change, finding new things, better things for our life. When Jesus connected with people, things started changing. It's true, isn't it? Now, he loved them the way they were, but he didn't leave them the way they were, right? As soon as they connected with Jesus, they felt hope. They felt better. Uh, if they were sick, they got healed, right? Now, in this side of the cross, if you're lost, you get saved. If you're in darkness, you find light. If you were dead, you come alive. Every person that connects with God, something changes in their life. Now, the bummer is, as Christians, life goes along, we stop growing. We stop changing. We stop experiencing new things. In fact, sometimes we get to that place where we want to act like we already know everything. Like, oh, yeah, I heard that sermon before. Well, if you have, why didn't you use it? Right? Oh, yeah, I've heard that. I read that scripture before. And you just start having that know-it-all. Oh, yeah, I already know that. And we stop seeking. And only those who seek can find. Only those who are hungry can be filled. Only those who want something new can have something new, right? So I'm praying today that you're hungry for things of God, that you're seeking after what God has for you, and you're ready to make changes to find more life in Christ. Come on, if that's you, just give the Lord a hand clap right there. Change may affect your spirit, your soul, your body, your relationships, your finances. The changes that God wants to bring to us can affect every part of our life. Usually, we're feeling good about some parts of our life, maybe emotionally, relationally. You're strong, you're happy, you're rejoicing in the Lord all as well. But maybe financially, you need something to change in your career, in, in the things that you are using your gifts and your talents for. You're not feeling that fulfillment. There's always something where God's trying to move us forward. And the reason is because we're called to be like Christ. Our primary mission, right? Your primary mission is not to get a certain amount of money in the bank. Your primary mission in life is not to find a husband or a wife. You've had three and they all turn out the same. <laughs> Just kidding. If I'm talking about you, I don't know it. <laughs> Our primary mission in life is not some of the things that many of us get really focused on. Our primary mission is to be like Christ. That's why we're called Christians. To be like Christ. When you get to heaven, the Lord's not going to talk to you about what furniture you had in your house. He's not going to ask you what was your net worth. He doesn't care about your position. He doesn't care what kind of car you drove. Those are things that are important to us. God could care less. The other day, somebody asked, do you think it's God's will for you to drive that car? I actually drive a Ford truck. As you think it's God's will? I said, I don't think God cares. He flies around in a fiery chariot. He certainly doesn't care what kind of car I drive. But we get focused on that stuff, right? And we start thinking, ooh, it's God's will for me to do. No, no, no. It's God's will primarily above all else that we become like Christ. And, and everything that God's doing in our life is helping us move toward that. And once we stop that process, once we begin to resist that process and not make those changes, we start losing that joy of the Lord, that anointing of the Lord, that presence of the Lord. Many Christians don't feel like God is with them. You hear it in their prayer. Oh, God, be with me. Well, how, what made you think he left? Lord, I just need to feel your presence. Why do you not? Well, it's because we're not experiencing growth. We're not experiencing change. We're not becoming more like Christ. So you start, you, you start sensing that loss of spirituality. So it's important that we recognize our primary calling is to be like Jesus. In 1 John chapter 4, the Bible said, as he is, so are we in this world right? Not just when you get to heaven, right? But a lot of times we put things off to heaven. Well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to renew my mind. Mm, probably not. 
That'd be a bummer, wouldn't it? When you get to heaven, you'd be like, Casey Treats teaching a Renewing the Mind seminar down Street 37. Go there now, because since you didn't do it on earth, you got to start working on it now. What if you got sent to a marriage seminar in heaven? You know, you were a lousy husband. You got to go down there and start working on your marriage. I'm in heaven. Yeah, get to work. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if it does, I'm going to crack up. Where was I? Oh, yeah. As he is, so am I in this world. So a lot of times, well, when we get to heaven, it's all going to be better. No, in this world, we are to be like Christ. In this world, we are to experience life as Jesus experiences it. So how is Christ? Is he sick? No, he's healed. Is he poor? No, he's sitting at the right hand of Father in the blessing of heaven. How is Jesus? Is he sad? No, he's filled with the joy of the Lord. Is he afraid? No, he walks by faith. There's no fear in him as he is. So are we in this world. Is he depressed? Does he need a drink every night to take the edge off? (laughs) Which, by the way, what's the edge? People always tell me, I just have a little drink, just a little glass of this to take the edge off. What's the edge? <laughs> and I live in Seattle, so if you want to have your drink to take the edge off, I'm just going to smoke a joint because I <laughs> Hey, it's better for you and it's legal. <laughs> when I say that, Wendy gets real nervous. She's like, don't talk that way. <laughs> They're going to think you actually do it. And as I keep hanging around these church people, I might start. Okay, so 19 years ago, the court put me in a rehab center. And I was at the Washington Drug Rehabilitation Center for two years, lived there. And that's where I became a Christian. That's where I met my spiritual father. He was the director of the program. And at 19 years old, I'm a spaced out drug addict, and they put me in this program, and I met my spiritual father. Two weeks after we met, he took me to church. I got born again. Then in my second year of rehab is when I went to Bible school. I met Wendy, right? And then a year later, we started Christian Faith Center. So if you want to be a minister, go to rehab, (laughs) and then you can be a pastor. So here's what I look like. Here's the mug shot that I had uh, the week or two before I went into rehab. So that's in Tacoma, Washington, Pierce County Jail. And I don't even remember that. I was on a different planet. I, somebody said, I heard a voice of the Lord. I said, hey, I thought I was the Lord. <laughs> you you use, use enough LSD, smoke enough pot, you can believe anything. So this is then Julius who became my spiritual father. I met him on the day I went in to Washington Drug Rehab Center. So Julius was almost 60 when we met. He'd been in prison for 24 years. And when he was there, he prayed, God, if you could use me, I'll help young men not become like me. So God heard his prayer, miraculously got him out of prison. He started this program. He'd become a Christian in prison. And and then that's where... That's where I walked in the door. So when people say, well, how'd you start Christian Faith Center? I often say, well, actually it was Julius. Because if it wasn't for him, I never would have come to the Lord. You know, my grandma took me to church a couple times. And it was one of those old-fashioned churches, you know, with old-fashioned pastor, which just means he was an old pastor. And, you know, singing out of the hymn book. They were nice people, but they didn't say anything that was relevant to me. They were really sweet, and everybody there, I I thought like, I don't remember really, but I think they were all old, and everything they talked about was irrelevant. Never go to a church that's answering questions that you're not asking. Right? See, at Living Word, everything we're about, every week, we're praying, we're studying, we're trying to think, what are your questions? How can I answer that? Right? How do I build relationship for the women? How do I build relationship with sisters? All right, that's what it's all about. May 11, be there. 
They'll answer your questions. How do I get my marriage strong? All right, we're teaching on marriage. We're having marriage events. We're trying to answer those questions. How do I raise my kids? How do I keep my kids from going crazy like me? All right, keep coming. We're going to help answer that question. We're trying to stay relevant because we can be like Christ in this world. As he is, so am I in this world. Now, what that means is anything in our lives that is not Christ-like, God has already empowered you to overcome that. It was a funny thing. We love talking about we're overcomers, right? We sing songs, we're overcomers, and we want to be overcomers. We just don't want to admit that we have anything to overcome. Are you with me? right? I'm an overcomer. Well, what have you overcome lately? Well, you know, I've been doing good. I really don't have any problems I want to talk about, but I'm just one. I'm an overcomer. No, that means you overcome things. So if fear is hindering your life, God's already empowered you to overcome that because you're called to be like Christ. If anger is part of your life, you have the ability to overcome that. Because you're called to be like Christ and Jesus is not slamming doors and stomping around the house, having a fit and acting angry. Hmm? Yeah, I saw you. I connected through your, through your webcam. Right, or maybe it's an addiction, right? We come to church and we act good. We all act good in church, but many of us are struggling with addiction. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, whatever it is. Or some other anxiety that, that affects us. And so we love the Lord, but we're not in the process of overcoming the things that keep us from being like Christ. Now, why do you want to be, why does God want us to be like Christ? Two reasons. One, it's the greatest fulfillment. It's the greatest joy that you can have in life. Two, it positions you to impact other people. Every time you overcome something, you can share with someone else, you can overcome that. Every time you win a battle, you can say to somebody else, you can win that battle. Every time you rise above a problem and live like God's called you to live, you become an epistle, a letter that others will read. Now, when you opt out, when we're Christians who make excuses, when we just stay in our poverty and stay in our selfishness and stay in our anger and stay in our fears, the world looks at us and says, well, those are Christians and they don't, they're no different than I am. They're not doing any better than I am. In fact, in many cases, Christians show a worse lifestyle than people in the world. It's sad, isn't it? So we are called to be like Christ. It's our primary mission. It will bring you the greatest joy and it'll also make you a great impact on the people around you. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans 8, 29. Paul writes to the church, whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, some people struggle with predestination and, and the idea that God is making something. God is forcing something. Well, if God predestined it, then it's going to happen anyway. Listen, God knowing doesn't mean God's controlling. It's like I watch my little granddaughter, and I know she's going to go to the television and smear her fingers all over the screen. I just know it. I can see she looks, and she's on her way. Four years old, she's going to do it. Doesn't mean I'm controlling her. Just means I know her. Okay? So God knows the choices we'll make. He knows we'll cry out to him. He knows those who will never cry out to him. He knows those who will never turn their heart to God. Even though they may be sitting in church. Jesus said, many will say, Lord, Lord. But I'll say, I never knew you. I knew that your heart never turned toward me. Your desire was never toward me. So whom he foreknows, he also predestines. So God saw that you would pray, that you would cry out to him, and God predestined you for what? Predestined to be conformed. Where'd my scripture go? 
predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So your primary calling to be like Jesus. You are predestined. You that have cried out to God. You that he knew. He predestined you to be conformed to the image of Christ. That means you already have God's strength, God's ability to overcome everything in your life that's not like Christ. The fear, the sickness, the poverty, the anxiety, the hurt, the addiction, whatever it is. We, you and I can overcome those things because we're predestined to be like him. And how is he? He's full of joy, full of peace. He's healthy. He's prospering. He's loving. He's kind. He's not down. He's not ang anxious. He's living in the will of God. You and I can do that. Now, we make a lot of excuses, don't we? We make up reasons why we can't change things in our life, right? Well, you know, everybody in my family has this heart problem. My great-grandfather had this heart problem, and my grandfather and my dad, and I got the same heart. But wait, I thought you got born again. I thought you got a new father. I thought you were a new creation in Christ. Old things pass away, all things become new. So sure, in the natural, we can inherit some things, genetics, we can pick up some things, but our faith connects us with God. And now we say, thank you, Father, you make all things new. So we're not making excuses, we're finding ways to overcome. Sometimes we say things like, well, everybody in my family goes through divorce. My parents, grandparents were divorced. My parents were divorced. Everybody, my, my brothers are divorced. Everybody in my family goes through. Divorce is normal for my family. But wait, I thought you were in God's family. I thought you had a new family. I thought you connected with the family of God through the Savior, Jesus Christ. So now in this new family, divorce is not normal. That's not how we roll. That's not how we flow. That's not our freestyle. Right? So you've got to stop making excuses for the way you are and start realizing your call to be like Christ. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we create national excuses. Well, I'm Irish. You know how the Irish are. What? Drunk? What, what are we, Irish? Well, all Irish people have a temper. So we have a national issue here. And we cannot become like Christ because everybody in Ireland has a bad temper. Really? Is that going to work? No, that's not true. But we say things like that, right? To make an excuse rather than become like Jesus. Well, I can't lose weight because my DNA and my hormones and my Mormons and... Well, come on, Jesus bore your sickness, carry your disease, healed your hormones, your Mormons, your DNA, healed it all with his stripes, you were healed. Now, listen, I'm not saying these things that we struggle with are small and insignificant. I get it. I have my struggles. You have your struggles. What I'm saying is we can overcome. In the world, you have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So connecting with Jesus gives us more than just a positive mental attitude, more than just some kind of mind over matter message. No, he's actually living in us by the Holy Spirit, helping us to be Christians. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. Let's, let's be like Christ. And let's believe there's nothing in our life that we cannot overcome. Now, how are you going to do it? All right. First of all, Colossians chapter three. How are you going to overcome? Colossians chapter three. Let's start right there. In Colossians chapter three and verse one, it says, if you are raised with Christ, if you're a Christian, if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, if you are born again, Seek those things which are above. Okay, first, you have to seek. You got to want it. You got to want it. Most people like seeking something. We seek things. It's a human behavior, and it's actually from the Lord. 
being hungry. Why, why do we spend hours on the internet? We're seeking stuff. We're looking for stuff. Oh, man, Wendy gets all excited. She tells me, I bought some new shoes today, really, because I know you needed some. <laughs> but I was on this one website, and it was 30% off the normal markdown, and I only spent $12 on these shoes. I'm like, wow, well, I can't afford not to buy those. <laughs> I saved so much money, we should buy two pair. But we're seeking stuff, aren't we? Guys, guys like to go hunting or looking at cars or motor, whatever it is. Why? We're seeking stuff. Girls go to the mall. They're just wandering around. What are you doing? I'm just looking. <laughs> just looking. What are you doing? I'm hunting for something that I didn't know I needed. <laughs> right? And, and me too. I go shopping and I like to shop. And then the guy, the guy says to me, uh, can I show you something? I'll say, I'll let you know when I find it. <laughs> I'm just hunting, right? I'm just seeking. Are you seeking to be like Christ? Are you seeking to make change in your life? Are you seeking to overcome the temper? Or have you given up and just said, well, this is the way I am. Are you seeking to find more joy? Or have you decided, well, you know, I'm just kind of a melancholy person. I'm kind of like Eeyore, you know. There's one in every family. Too bad my whole family's that way, but. <laughs> have you given up and stopped seeking? Oftentimes we'll say, well, I was born this way. You know, I was, I've been this way since I was a kid. Yeah, but there's a lot of things you were when you were a kid that you shouldn't still be. And again, weren't you born again? Mm -hmm. Was it Lady Gaga that sings a song, Born This Way? Yeah, she needs to get born again. Because she was born crazy. A girl walking around wearing bacon and everything. That girl was born crazy. Whew, thank God there's a new birth. Thank God there's a second birth. Thank just. Thank God Jesus said, you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. So stop saying you were born that way and start saying, I've been born again. Jesus empowers me to be a new person. So I'm going to overcome this depression. I'm going to overcome this anxiety. I'm going to overcome these fears. I'm going to overcome this temper. I'm going to become like Jesus in every part of life. You have to seek. If you are a Christian, seek those things which are above. All right, are you still there? Colossians chapter three, look at verse two. How, how do you seek things that are above? Set your mind on things above. Now that doesn't mean walking around trying to think what heaven looks like. No, no. It means set your mind on things that will help you live a godly life. So you can't set your mind on some of those websites you've been going to. You don't have to delete that and get it off your life because when your mind is there, you can't be like Christ. You're going to have to stop hanging around certain people that get you thinking and talking a certain way because you're supposed to set your mind on things above. So you're just going to have to tell your friends, look, come on to church with me. Hang out with me there. I can't hang out with you at the club anymore. Come on. You were out at the club last night, shaking your booty, thinking you're cool. But now here in church, you're like, oh, Jesus. You got to set your mind on things above. And everything that distracts your mind from things above, you're going to have to get that out of your life. I mean, if you're hungry, if you're seeking, if you really want to be like Christ, it's possible if you'll set your mind on things above. Now, when I first got saved, and sometimes even now, I kind of feel like, man, I wish I could set my mind, but my mind is out of control. My mind has a mind of its own. I don't know who's in charge of my mind. My mind won't mind. You ever felt that way? But Jesus said, you can set your mind, so that means it's possible. Remember, there's nothing in the Bible that he's asked us to do that's impossible. Because if he asked you to do it, you can do it, or he wouldn't have asked you to do it. It's like when I'm with my granddaughter, and we're playing on the swing or the slide, and I say, okay, jump, Papa will catch you. She's like, 
I can't. Yes, you can. I know you can. I'm smarter than you. Right? I know she can do it. And God says, set your mind. And you're like, uh, uh, I can't. God says, yes, you can. You can if you want to. Now, here's the deal. You don't have to do any of this. You don't have to do any of this. If Jesus is your Lord, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven, forget all this crap. Oh, sorry, we don't say that in church, do we? <laughs> Young people, do not say that. You don't have to change. You don't have to set your mind. You don't have to overcome. You can just stay the way you are. You can die and go to heaven. Probably die quicker if you don't change. Right? You don't have to be healthy. You don't have to have friends. You don't have to come to church. You can be miserable. You can be lonely. You can be sick. You can be anything you want. If Jesus is your Lord, you love the Lord, you're going to heaven. I say, go. <laughs> Should have just held you down at water baptism. <laughs> How long do you hold them down, Pastor? <laughs> Till there's no more bubbles. <laughs> Why? Because I know this one's not going to change. Let's just send them on to heaven. Woo. That's a crazy church over there. They do a lot of baptisms and a lot of funerals. No, you don't have to do Listen, you don't have to do this. We love you. God loves you. We're talking about if you want God's will. We're talking about if you want God's favor and God's blessing and you want to see your destiny and fulfill his calling and be the person that he knows you can be. That's what we're talking about. So if you want the good, the acceptable and perfect will of God, then you have to set your mind on things above, right? Are you with me? And even today, I had to decide, I'm going to think on this. I'm not going to think on that. And really, when you're setting your mind on things above, you have to get focused on what you want and what God wants for you and, and ignore. It's like you cannot not think about something. Okay, what time is it? 10.15. Don't think about coffee. Don't think about it. Don't think about a latte or a mocha or a frappuccino. Don't go there. Stay right here with me. And don't think about banana bread <laughs> with coffee. <laughs> don't even think about what you're going to do for lunch today. What, I, I offended you? Uh, she's going to work. She's getting ready. Aren't you glad for our young people leading worship in church? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for young people leading worship in church. How many went to that church that had Sister Beulah on the organ? Oh, my gosh. I'm trying to worship, and it feels like a funeral. Okay, where was I? Oh, yeah, coffee and banana bread. What time is it? We're out of here. But you see, you understand what I mean. You cannot not think about it. I'm not going to think about that person I'm mad about. Well, you're thinking about them. I'm not going to think about how they hurt my feelings, but you are. I'm not going to think about why they let me go from my job, but yeah, you're, it's consuming your mind. I'm not going to think about this problem in my life, but we get focused there, don't we? So the only way to set your mind on things above is to replace those negative thoughts with godly thoughts. So today I'm thinking about the joy of the Lord, and I believe the joy of the Lord is my strength. And you can do it in different ways. You can read a book. You can have cards with scriptures. You can open your Bible, or you can just go over things in your mind and keep your mind set on things above. And it'll try to get away. Your mind, you know, has a mind of its own. And it'll go back. Yeah, but they didn't. Do, they, and then he hurt my feelings. They shouldn't have said that. Why did he say that? I mean, he shouldn't. Oh, get back to set my mind. 
And the more you practice it, the better you get at setting your mind on things above. And then look what's going to happen. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. You'll put on a new man who is renewed in knowledge. A new woman renewed in knowledge. You see, a lot of us are waiting for God to just change us. Well, he wants to change you, but a change happens as you set your mind, as there's new knowledge, as there's a new way of thinking. As a man thinketh, as a woman thinks in their heart, so they be. So they are, so they live. God's thoughts are higher, God's ways are higher. If you'll set your mind on things above, you'll rise up to a higher way of life. You don't have to do it. You don't have to. You love the Lord, you're going to heaven. But if you want to see what God has planned for you, predestined for you, become more like Christ. Seek those things which are above. Let's find out what this Christian life can really be all about. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. Let's close our eyes together. Close your eyes with me. If you're not sure where you are with God, if you've not been born again, or you were at one time, but then you got distracted, you got hurt, you've gone through things in your life, and today you're not sure where you are with God. If that's you, I want to pray with you. You're not born again, or you've got disconnected from God. Let's pray together. How many would say, Casey, you're talking to me. I'm not born again, or I'm not sure where I am with God because I've been through some things in my life. Just lift up your hand and just wave at me real quick. I want to make sure, pray with you before we go. All right, I got you. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Good. Perfect. All right, congregation, let's pray this prayer together. Say it out, Liz out loud with me. You can put your hands down. Let's say it together. Today, Father, I believe Jesus is Lord. I pray you come into my life, Lord Jesus. I thank you for salvation. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for a wonderful destiny. From this day on, I'm turning away from the world I'm turning to you, Lord. I'm a Christian, born again. I'm following you in Jesus' name. Amen.